Hi, uh, good morning. Um, can everyone hear me with this microphone? Good. Um, I move around a lot, so I feel a little stiff with that one. <laughs> um, I, I am going to talk about uh, something I've been paying a lot of attention to and some folks have alluded to. Um, about four years ago, I did write the obituary for Great Salt Lake to get attention to the lake, so you might not think of me as an optimist. Um, but the more that I study the flexibility of the species that live there, I think the more um, I'm thinking optimistically. And so I wanted to talk about both sides of the coin um, on when we think about life in Great Salt Lake, both the fragility and the vulnerability, but also the resilience. Um, so the questions that I'm really going to focus on are, you know, what what are the threats to the food chains, um, and and what do we pr predict as this basin gets saltier and drier? What we saw last year was otherworldly in terms of how salty the South Arm got. Um, can we increase uh, the water in the lake if we can? Will the life rebound? So last November, as has been pointed to, you know, we hit this historic low. And if you look at this line um, from the hydromapper, this is not good where the biology sits. Do you see we're in the red? Um, and, and that's largely because of the salinity. Um, so we got to, I'm going to talk about salinity in percent today because I think that's a more accessible number for most of us um, instead of molarity or grams per liter or um, other, other um, units. So 19% uh, salt is what we hit in the fall um, and that's well out of range for what the biology likes. So I uh, just downloaded this video from the International Space Station. They did a flyover at Great Salt Lake a couple weeks ago, and it's absolutely beautiful. But um, what's stunning about the image is how it shows all this snow. So we are a little happy about this reprieve. Um, maybe it buys us a little time. We're hoping that the salinity in the lake this summer can come down to about 15%. Um, that still puts us at about the summer of 2021 or so, so um, we really would like to be better than that. I like to plot the current situation of the lake in the dark blue next to the historic average versus the 1986 high water line because that's not aspirant. We don't want to go to flooding. Um, what, what we want is this 4200 um, lighter blue outline. Uh, so that's, that's really what we're aiming toward. That's our aspiration. And part of the reason is, again, the salinity and how that impacts the biology. So um, I, I made this crude little curb um, just to show you that um, as you increase salinity, and uh, I think this is my pointer. Yes, as you increase salinity, notice my silly little salt shakers. Um, as you increase salinity, you you lessen the biodiversity. So the biodiversity of the ocean at about 3.5% salt is um, is pretty immense, right? You've got animals, you've got you've got all of these incredible life forms living in the ocean. When you get to a salinity that's more like the south arm of Great Salt Lake, um, you you really um, get to something that's way more, um, way less biodiverse. You've got microbialites that feed flies, you've got algae that feed shrimp, and then you've got birds that eat those things. So they really are quite um, uh, simple, these food chains in Great Salt Lake. If you go to the north arm, you really live in a world of bacteria and archaea and these prokaryotic microbes. There also are a host of fungi that we've been isolating, which are kind of fun. Um, but you're in the microorganism world. It doesn't really work well. Oh, and I don't know what happened to that monitor. I didn't do anything. Um, is everybody okay over there? You can see that one. Okay. Oh, I'm back. Okay, so the south arm of Great Salt Lake is really where this talk is going to focus. Um, not just because we've now isolated the north arm for a while, but, all, but because this is where the, uh, the food chains really lie that I'm going to talk about today. 
Um, and you can think about the food chains as uh, two linear food chains where the microbialite mats feed the flies on the bottom and the birds eat that. And, and then the algae in the water column feed the shrimp and the birds eat those things. Um, and I don't know if the tech people are around, I don't know what's going on with this screen on the left, but you're on it. Okay, good. Um, I forgot you're over there. I should be, hi. <laughs> um, so these linear food chains, these really simple food chains, one of the things I, I want to point out, because I'm really not an ecologist, so I've had to do a lot of reading to think hard about food chains, is, is that the dependency um, is really on these primary producers. Um, the biomass is huge with primary producers in the system, and it really matters how well the algae are doing. This whole system could crash if the algae and cyanobacteria crash. Everything is, is resting on that. Um, so it, it's uh, important when you study microorganisms to think that you are important when most people don't. Ha, ha, ha. Um, okay, this is me um, sampling at the lake about 10 years ago. I have equipment and a dog, as a scientist should have. Um, and I'm using this image to show you just how green the water is sometimes, um, or, or how it was at one time. And in this picture, you can see both the thick microbialite mats which are um, kind of dark. They're so thick and heavy that they're really dark in the water. And you can also see algae that's in the water column itself. Um, and, and so that's very green and very wonderful for the animals that need to eat those things. Um, I, I am talking about this in terms of food chains. And I checked in with a lot of ecologists to ask, um, is it OK if I say food chains instead of food webs? Because I feel like. When I was in, you know, middle school, I got corrected for that. So <laughs> I want to make sure it's okay. Um, because it seems to me these food chains are very simple and they're more chain than web. Um, but there are a couple crossover points. Um, for instance, in the shallows, sometimes the shrimp will graze on these microbialite mats. And, uh, and sometimes the fly larvae who are hanging out in the water column will eat some of the algae in the water column. They're pretty indiscriminate feeders, you know, whatever fits in their mouth. Um, so it makes sense that there's some crossover. Um, there's also a little bit of crossover with the birds. There's some birds that eat both shrimp and flies. Um, but that's about the extent of it. People use the idea, the concept of food webs to describe intricacies and hierarchies and so forth, and we don't have a lot of that. So I'm going to continue to talk about these as food chains for the moment, and it helps me isolate the species involved and tell you how salinity is going to impact them. So let's start with the brine shrimp food chain. Um, so who do they eat? Um, if you look at who's in the water in terms of the algae, um, Phil Brown and others have um, published this nice paper that, that used genetics to amplify everybody who was present, and they found there's some diatoms. Um, well, brine shrimp don't particularly like those guys in feeding experiments. They're sometimes bigger than their mouths, and they're really crunchy because they're full of silica. They're not really happy about that. Um, they will eat some cyanobacteria that you know happen along in the water column. But one of the most prevalent organisms that you see visually in a microscope um, in in, at certain times in the lake water is Denaliella, um, particularly Denaliella vertis in the south arm of the lake. And that's a little picture I have of a Denaliella um, swimming around. That's their favorite food. So um, I'm going to focus on that a little bit. Um, as I introduce their scientific name to you, Artemia franciscana, because it's the same species they have in the San Francisco um, salt ponds. Um, it's really hard to take video of them without them having sex, so I'm really sorry. It's kind of like, it's kind of like showing porn in a uh, private setting, um, but they are cute little monkeys. Um, so uh, the Artemia life cycle is interesting because um, they, they, they do have live birth in the summer, and those guys grow up and they make more babies, um, and. 
it is a stress response for them to insist their embryos and to put them aside in these little cysts. And so the cold temperatures that come later in the fall will cause them to form cysts um, instead of live birth. And, and so when they do that, it again, it's a stress response. And then all of the adults die in the cold winter temperatures. And the cysts are floating on the lake and ready for the next spring when it warms up and they get some fresh water streaming and they hatch again. Um, so the, the cyst form is really important. So last summer, one of the observations um, that the Great Salt Lake Ec Ecosystem Program uh, had and the Brian Shrimp Companies was, was that the, they, ins they s insisted their embryos early. They did that in the summer. And then some of those cysts, of course, started to come out of dormancy by the time we got to winter. So there's some concern about that shift in the life cycle. But notice also they are responding to stress in the environment. In, in particular, the high salinity was stressing them out then. So they said, hey, my world is dying. Let me uh, insist some embryos. So they do have strategies to deal with this, right? And I think that's an important observation. It, you can get kind of sad about it, but you also can get kind of happy that they have strategies. Whoops. Um, so let's talk about what happens when the water gets too salty for that Denaliella um, and also for the brine shrimp. What happens to the microalgae? What happens to the shrimp? First, I need to take us back to when you were 12 and you had to memorize something about osmosis. And there was something about a membrane. We're not sure what it was. Um, what, what happens is water can move in and out of cellular membranes. So no matter what kind of organism you are, you are made of cells and your cells do osmotic behavior. So water can move, but molecules can't move without a lot of energy. So consider this, if you have a lot of things on the outside of the membrane, like those large blue spheres, um, then uh, the water wants to rush from the left side over to the right. Does that make sense? It wants to dilute what is outside. And so if you're a cell living, if you put our cells in salt water and looked at them under a microscope, they send their water to the outside and they shrivel up. Okay, that's why we can't live in Great Salt Lake. Well, there's, you know, breathing oxygen too, that's important. But um, the, other, the other thing that happens to things that are designed by evolution to live in a high salt environment is they will accumulate molecules on the other side um, of that membrane inside the cell. And that helps them balance osmotically and then they don't shoot all their water across the membrane. Um, so that's really important and so all Everybody who lives in a high salt environment, they have a means to do that. Some of the halophiles I study accumulate lipids inside their cells to do that. Um, Denaliella accumulates glycerol uh, to balance. Um, this is energy expensive. As you go up in salt, you need to make more balancing molecules, right? So um, it gets really expensive for the cells to turn on all these factories to, to produce all of these molecules. So it's exhausting to the cells and, and they can do that for some time, but I point to time because we don't know what that time course is. So this is why on the south side of the causeway um, where this green water lies, um, we have these uh, vibrant, this vibrant ecosystem, but on the north side, we're really um, just flourishing at the microbial level with these uh, pink mi microbes that live there. So it's less salty over here than it is over here. So if you ask the question, and these scientists did, um, of what is the favorite salinity of a Denaliella? I know some people go to sleep at night wondering that question. Um, and it is two molar, and I've translated that into percent for our conversation, around 12%. So this red line, around 12% is their happy place. They like that. They like that. They don't really like it um, higher than that. So if you look at, if you look at Denaliella, um, as you increase salinity across here, more and more and more salt, um, and right about here is 12%. 
um, you start to accumulate glycerol. That's what's on this axis here. So more and more and more glycerol gets accumulated inside. Again, that's a strategy to balance, but it's also carbon storage. Every glycerol molecule has three carbons. So it's like, I better hang on to this food, right? So it's helping them bal balance osmotically. But it has made me wonder about brine shrimp and how even if the Denaliella are lower in the population, the number of them, because they're having a hard time growing, because reproduction takes expense as well, in that high salt, they reproduce less quickly, as I showed you in the last graph. So, but maybe each cell is more nutritious because it has a lot of glycerol, right? So you're getting more bang for your buck, right? More at the buffet. Okay, so the shrimp themselves, they are dealing at high salt with less food, but they also require more energy to do reproduction um, and, and high salt and to balance themselves in the salt. And if you look through the literature, you'll see that 12% is their happy place. That is when they do their best reproduction. Um, and uh, the juveniles, though, are rather flexible. They 90% of them will survive to maturity um, in, in a range between 10 and 17%. So shrimp are probably one of the most flexible animals in terms of salt concentration. They can just uh, turn on and off the systems they need to survive. But it can't go on forever because it's stressful, right? It, you know how um, sometimes in your life you have these really stressful periods where you're working really hard or you're doing a lot of stuff but it, and it's intense. But then you say, okay, this can't go on forever. I have to now go on vacation, right? Um, so I, I think it's kind of like that. What is the timeline? We really don't know. Um, my background is genetics, so I'm going to show you a gene map, but you don't have to even know what the genes are. I just want you to pay attention to the colors. Um, these are salinities that correspond to, in this case, 3.5%. Um, so at 3.5, at ocean salinity, um, the brine shrimp is firing off these genes trying to do basic metabolism and reproduction, um, not terribly happy, um, but it's not firing off stress genes. Um, when you go up in salinity, um, you see the stress genes start to come on at the expense of basic metabolism. So in that final, um, over here in that final column, that 23%, now we're getting up towards the north arm, and the, the shrimp are really stressed, and they're not able to turn on their basic processes. So it's, it's important to think about um, what that means. For those of us who have spent some time working in the north arm, when you see shrimp up there, they're small, and they're bright red because carotenoids are antioxidants. They're trying to prevent damage to their cells at that high salinity. So uh, they're not happy. Their happy place is also around 12%, but they're flexible. Okay, so back to the food chains, and let's switch over to the right-hand side, and let's talk about the flies. So I've spent a lot of time studying microbialite mats, and I know some of you in the room probably haven't heard of microbialites, so I want to explain them for a second. These luscious, that's right, you use luscious when you're a scientist, um, microbialite mats that grow and do photosynthesis and cause the precipitation of calcium carbonate. Um, and that forms a rock. So it's literally biology that makes geology, which I think is so cool. Um, but you can see that thick, you can almost feel the texture of this mat. And on there, um, the lighting isn't great for that in here, but on here you can see little brine fly pupa and you can see little brine fly larva. The brine fly larvae are basically the caterpillar, if you remember the butterfly story, um, how you have the adults that make a caterpillar that becomes a cocoon that then hatches into a butterfly. Well, it's a little less sexy, but brine flies do the same thing. And, and so here are the little caterpillar forms, and then they form the little cocoons on the microbialites. And these should be underwater. This is one we've pulled out of water just for the picture. Um, this is my student, Victoire. And we were out at uh, the lake um, in the summer of 2021. This is when this was. And you can see the mats. So these, these microbialite mats should look nice and thick and dark under um, the water. 
uh, where they can both feed the brine flies and also provide a substrate for them to make their little cocoons on and pupate. Um, so this is a brand new graphic. Um, my uh, co colleague who's a scientist and also a graphic artist has been working on some of these for me um, that you'll see today, including the food chains, Sheila Homburger, and I'll thank her in the acknowledgments again. But um, the flies lay eggs on the surface of the lake. Um, these turn into the little caterpillars. The larvae have a few stages as they grow. They go down to the microbialites and they munch munch, munch, munch on those cyanobacterial-based mats. And then they pupate, and then this is the coolest part. Um, they have this cool like um, crevice in the top of their exoskeleton of their head that opens up, a balloon pops out, busts the end of the pupa off, um, and then goes back together, closes their head, and they're birthed into an air bubble underwater. And that is just the coolest thing ever. I just picture zombie flies walking around with these balloons coming out of their heads. But anyway, uh, these flies then come up. After all of that work, they, they are, are uh, released to the surface of the water, and a bird eats them. So it seems like a lot of energy um, to put into one's life until you realize that they spend like six to nine months as a larva and only three days as an adult fly. So they're really having all their fun time when they're a larva. Um, so what happens to these mats when it gets too salty? And what happens to the flies when it gets too salty? So we know that the microbialites are very vulnerable to both uh, too salty and too dry, hypersalinity and desiccation. Um, they are in the shallows of the lake because they need to collect sunshine. And so as the lake shrinks, they're being exposed. So just, they're just vulnerable because of their location, first of all. Um, and we also are seeing, um, we have studied the structures in the north arm, and they have no cyanobacteria left in them. Um, so we think they're vestiges from when this was one lake. So we do know they can get too salty, and they can die. The question, again, is timeline. How long can they be at that high salinity? Um, and we know that the beached microbialites will lose their mats on the surface, but we have some experiments now to show that underneath that carbonate, um, those carbonate granules, those mats can probably replenish themselves, and we're seeing that in the lab. So this is a picture um, that I took, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now of these microbialite structures out in the north arm. Um, and you can just see visually that they're dead. They, they don't have mats, and they're, they've got salt crust on them, and they're living in this pink water. Um, and what we're seeing in the south arm now, uh, this was early last summer in June. Um, they were really starting. Th these were the same structures I showed you with Victoire that were underwater in 2021. Um, and then if you notice um, this past summer, this is what happened. Um, they, the water just was nowhere, and obviously these look dead, but can we rehydrate them? I'll show you that in just a minute. So we published a paper in Ecology a few years ago um, that looked at microcosm experiments with microbialites, and um, the optimum was around 10%. We didn't do anything between 10 and 15, um, but at 15, you can see that it starts to go down. Um, 20 and 25%, I would say, are restrictive salinities. We actually started to lose the mats. They died, and we're measuring chlorophyll as a proxy, for example, and, and we were also were measuring DNA of the organisms that lived there. So we had two measures of abundance, and they were just going down, down, down. So that salinity is not good. Last year, we got to 19%. It makes sense why the mats were dying everywhere we went, um, because they are probably at a restrictive salinity. Um, so we didn't do 19% in this particular experiment, um, but I'm pretty sure it's close enough to that uh, restrictive boundary that that's what was happening. Um, so the mats are protected by something called uh, an exopolysaccharide matrix. And it's kind of, I liken it to slime or goo. 
um, they, they extrude this and they become a biofilm. And that helps them capture these carbonate granules and form the rock. But it also protects them. Um, I was just reading a paper yesterday about a cyanobacterium that was sent into space for a space exposure experiment. And it turns out that this, um, the, the cells on the surface died, but, but because of that EPS um, and the layer of cells on the surface, the cells underneath survived. So I think this could be a helpful survival mechanism um, to protect. And we know that uh, from the literature, it protects against UV light, it protects against high salinity, pH shifts, osmotic shock, all kinds of things. So I think um, I'm hopeful that these mats can survive in part because of this sticky goo. We got to come up with a better word for it than EPS. Um, we've been isolating this Euhalothesis species in our lab. Um, and I'll give a shout out to my student, Caitlin Christensen, who's been taking pieces of microbialites and streaking them onto plates and isolating lots of different cultures and trying to amplify their DNA. Um, our goal is to sequence the genome of a good isolate and uh, to try to probe that for genes involved in resiliency. So we'll look for more in the future on that. Um, so back to this picture of a microbialite, just to remind you, the flies are eating and pupating on this structure. It's a very, very important structure for them. Um, and you can see that this is work by Dave Herbst, who is a brine fly god, and he mostly works at Mono Lake. Um, this is work he did in these salt ponds in the Mojave Desert, actually. And I'll just uh, make this quick. So this isn't at Great Salt Lake, but we can learn from his study. This is um, his low saline pools. He counted, if you see the blue is larva, the orange is pupa, um, and the gray is, uh, are the adults. And, and so he, he counted uh, flies in ponds that were considered low, that were in this range, in ponds that were medium. That's the happy place, remember the 9 to 12% for many of our species, um, and in high salinity ponds. And it seems like under the low salinity conditions, they were doing fine. Medium, um, everybody seems to be good. Uh, for some reason, the larva tended to do better at the lower salinity. Um, and uh, what's interesting to me is at the high salinity, and again, above in this case, 14% and above, uh, the flies were starting to uh, be smaller and smaller in number. Um, another experiment he did that I'm just going to add on this graph was to look at the, the pupa, which I have a little drawing of on the right, those little cocoons, and see how many of them had opened. If they've opened, that means that a brine fly was born. And if the pupa casings instead were closed, the brine fly was stuck inside and, and never came out into the world. And, and so he used these open um, bars to show um, where open cases had released flies. So I put a little fly in there to remind you. Um, so that's just percentage. So most of the flies had hatched out of those um, pupa in that case. And in the high salinity, a much smaller proportion had hatched. So we do know from other studies on the same species of our main fly, um, Ephedra uh, cinerata, that, that we are indeed looking at a situation where we are not in their happy place. And this makes perfect sense why we started seeing the flies crash last year. Um, I'll give a shout out to Carly Beetle, who's trying to get um, REI to endorse her by wearing her orange puff in every media event. Um, <laughs> She has been studying the, the flies as I've been studying the microbialites. And Dave Herbst came out. And thank you to Friends of Great Salt Lake and National Audubon for helping us to fund his visit. He helped train Carly and our students on what to do and what to look for. And they continue to work together and call each other Team Fly. Um, so here's Dave working with our student, Cora. Um, uh, collecting flies in the field. And we've now, uh, this is Bridget and, and Cora in the lab, um, they've now set up different uh, pupation experiments at different salinities. Um, they, he even sent them to BYU to 
um, to look at old insects that had been pinned because he wanted to know what was the size of Great Salt Lake flies in the past. And if you ask an entomologist, they're like, we have those. We have them from 1923, right? So um, Cora actually went down there with Carly and measured the size of these flies. And so now they're doing microscopy on these current uh, flies and pupa. And what we're seeing is that they're smaller. They're smaller than they should be. So smaller in number and smaller in size. Those are the preliminary observations. And this spring, uh, they're setting up monitoring experiments. And hopefully with a good water year, we'll have a good fly year. And that will serve as a good baseline as we experience drought in the future. Um, some of their pictures are kind of gruesome. Um, but this is a young uh, larva. This is a pupa. And this is an adult. And this is a video. You can see the itty bitty larva crawling around, uh, brine shrimp cyst for scale. Um, and this is a pupa at the bottom. Um, you can see how itty bitty some of these early larvae are. And you can watch them just crawl around and eat off the microbialite. Here's a bigger larva. It's really gruesome, really creepy. I want to be one for Halloween. Um, so now let's go to the top of the food chain and let's think a little bit about how the birds are impacted by salinity because I'm not a birdologist and I was thinking for a while um, that the birds were just going to struggle because they couldn't find food, right? That, that it'll affect the birds because when I look at this pyramid, I'm like, well, if the primary producers are low and the shrimp and flies are low, of course the birds are going to struggle, right? That makes sense to me. But as I started reading more about it, it's more than just food. So first, let's talk about the food. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mike Conover, who's done a ton of this work. And I have some of his papers, including the chapter in our book, is the, the first uh, reference. And also, Anthony Roberts did a great review that includes a lot of work from DWR. Um, and, uh, and, and so altogether, what I've learned, and I've tried to organize this in terms of flies and uh, shrimp. So I've started off with the shrimp eaters. At the bottom are the fly eaters. And I've tried to include what parts of the life cycle um, the birds are eating. And thank you to National Audubon, particularly Max Momquist, and to John Neal at, um, at GSLAP, who have really helped put this together um, in terms of uh, finding all the references. And I turned it into a graphical representation. I hope it's OK, John. Um, so notice there's some birds in the middle that eat both shrimp and flies. There's some that are wholly dependent on shrimp or wholly dependent on flies. Um, but different parts of their life cycle are represented. These are birds that are here in very, very large numbers. These are important birds. Um, and I think people have thrown around uh, the question, if we have um, an Endangered Species Act listing in the future, what birds would it be? And the answer usually falls to the eared grebe, who really depends on shrimp and flies, um, and also um, Wilson's phalarope. Um, not redneck phalarope, but the Wilson's phalarope, who very much depends on flies. So we've got to keep the shrimp and the flies healthy. And that means keeping the algae and the cyanobacteria healthy. And that means lowering the salinity of the lake. And how do we do that? Repeat after me, get water to the lake. <laughs> All right, that's how we do that. Um, these grebes are so darling. I don't know if you've ever been out on the water and they just come up to you. They think your boat's a big grebe and they talk to you. Um, this is a picture I took of phalaropes. I was actually sampling microbialites. Do you see the flies? Yeah, we didn't see that last summer. Um, this is a gull flying, uh, doing that open mouth gesture. I won't do that dance in front of everyone, but we did invent a dance to show gulls eating flies. Um, so I, I, I'm keying this up for John Loft, who's coming on in just a couple minutes, um, to, because he's going to talk more about the birds. So the birds are impacted by high salinity, like I said, because of loss of food um, and also loss of habitat. Um, they, as the lake is shrinking, their habitat is changing. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, many species require all these different little sub-ecosystems within the lake. 
um, in order to nest at one spot, feed at another spot, etc. And so I think also that's something we don't think about. This habitat is changing as the lake is shrinking, and that's really important. It's not just about the dried microbialites and loss of pupation habitat um, for the brine flies and the birds that need, need them to live. Um, I read something about this yesterday about behavior changes that people see birds experience as water gets saltier at other systems, that they have to fly more to get to fresh water, which I thought was kind of interesting. But the thing I'm really um, learning a lot about is this, is this osmoregulation. I'm really thinking about this a lot lately. And it turns out that birds have to do this too. So they, many of these water birds have um, salt glands that helps them take in a bunch of salt water and extrude the salt because the salt isn't good for them. Um, and I've actually uh, had John uh, help me sample salt glands of pelicans out on Gunnison Island, sorry. But we did grow some cool microbes out of, out of the salt glands. That was neat. Uh, we just swabbed them. We didn't hurt them. Um, and I'm pointing to their nostrils in the back of their throat because they're in their trachea. Who knew? Um, so salts can accumulate um, in the bird, and they need to get rid of it. And, and that's really kind of cool. This figure comes from this paper I referenced. Um, about all the different ways that birds can deal with salt. So to end this, I just wanted to mention the resiliency and flexibility that I've already talked about. Um, that EPS, that goo that is secreted by cyanobacteria, could be helpful. Accumulation of the glycerol and the microalgae. The invertebrates have their flexibility in terms of brine shrimp reproductive flexibility. Brine fly have refugia, and I didn't really talk about that, but Sam, some of us, and others have talked about um, groundwater around the lake coming up in little pools and making less saline pools where the brine flies can kind of hang out when the main body of the lake gets too salty. And then when the water comes back into the lake, they can um, rehabit that, that system. And birds obviously have uh, flexible mechanisms for getting rid of salt and diet switching and so forth. But again, what is the recovery timeline? We know um, from work that Carrie Franz has done uh, that my lab helped with, um, we have a paper that's been submitted that hopefully will be accepted soon. Um, we know that we can rehydrate these microbialites and bring them back to life. Um, so there's enough cyanobacteria after a few months. Um, and even if, if they get too dry, but how long, how long? After a few months, yes, we can bring them back to life. This is a picture from Gunnison Island. These are some microbialites um, that are both too dry and too salty. We know that decades is too long, right? So we've done that experiment. Decades is too long. Months, we can bring them back to life. So the key take-homes for me are that, um, a declining lake really means a reduction in habitat and food, and that high salinity can cause osmoregulation stress. And the timeline is, is uncertain. And I'll give a shout out to the wetlands really quickly. I didn't talk about the wetlands. I'm just talking about the open water. Um, also, another thing you read about when you read about trophic levels is concentration of toxins, and that's something also to consider when we're talking about food chains. So I'll just thank everybody, um, Carly Beadle, our team fly captain, and our students, Sheila Homberger, who did the uh, food chain and life cycle graphics for us, and um, our collaborators that we're working with right now at various institutions. So, um, and lastly, on the bottom are our funding sources. Thank you so much.